Good morning. I'm Melvin Everson, VP of Economic Development here at Gwinnett Technical College, and on behalf of Dr. Cannon, who is not able to be here, he's at a other location in Alpharetta. I want to welcome you all here, the distinguished gentleman here, the young lady from the Senate uh, Study Committee, uh, as they come to take input from the citizens in Gwinnett County and around in regards to some proposed legislation. Thank you all so much for being here, and as you uh, traverse through this campus here, the facilities, uh, men's restrooms are to the left, and the women's restroom straight back. And if you came on campus, you notice a new building going up, and I want to thank these gentlemen here for allowing us to have the new emerging technology building that's going up now, 34.8 million cybersecurity building here at Gwinnett Technical College. With both of our campuses, this location here in Lawrenceville and the one in uh, Alpharetta, on the credit side and the non-credit side, continuing education, which I cover, we run approximately 21,000 students through both of our campuses. We're a two-year institution with articulation agreements with Georgia Tech, Georgia State, Morehouse, Spelman. Once they graduate from Gwinnett Tech, they can go on to University of Georgia, Georgia Gwinnett College, et cetera with those credits being transferred to those universities. And that hasn't always been the case, and the General Assembly passed legislation to make that possible. We pride ourselves here at Gwinnett Tech. We consider it the flagship of the 22 technical colleges in the state of Georgia, because as Dr. Cannon would say, our mission here is train to retain, educate, train to retain businesses in Gwinnett and North Fulton and across the state of Georgia as George is recognized as being the best state to do business for the eighth consecutive year in a row. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And with that, we will turn it over to Senator Clint Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Everson. I appreciate that. Um, I will now call the study committee on nonpartisan elections for local school board members to order. Uh, before we get started, just want to express my gratitude to Gwinnett Technical College for allowing us to have this study committee hearing uh, here at their campus today. Uh, you know, Gwinnett Technical College is, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, it's my day job. I'm, I'm a real estate. I'm involved in real estate, and I actually uh, took the class uh, to get licensed here at, at Gwinnett Technical College almost 20 years ago. It's hard to believe that. And then my wife also uh, went through the dental program here at Gwinnett Technical College and actually was employed as a receptionist uh, many years ago. So excited to see the growth here. Um, excited to have uh, everyone here today. I know it's a busy time of year and thank you for coming out. Uh, with, without any further ado, we'll call our first speaker, uh, Terry Stalker, if you would come forward uh, to address the board. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, and before you get started, oh, yes. we've, we've got quite a, quite a bit of speakers that have signed up uh, compared to last week. Uh, Gwinnett Technical College, you know, to be mindful of, of the time slot. They've given us two hours uh, for this uh, committee meeting, so we want to be respectful to that. So we're going to uh, try to keep each speaker at about three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Terry Stalker. I have three boys in Gwinnett County Public Schools dating back to 2010. I believe the original objective of this committee was addressing whether all school boards should be nonpartisan rather than a referendum on Gwinnett County Public Schools, which would of course be a local issue and led by a majority of that delegation. In last week's hearing, I was surprised at no scheduled testimony from subject matter experts and at citizen input from a single county. I have not seen any data from this committee to support the notion that nonpartisan elections for Board of Elections resolve any of the issues related to education. I must note that Senator Dixon is from Gwinnett County and primarily represents the city of Buford, which has its own school system separate from Gwinnett County Public Schools with its own board. I would also note that the proposal, the timing of this proposal is most interesting. Gwinnett County Public Schools, with Gwinnett County having a majority minority population for many years, didn't elect its first person of color to the Board of Education until 2018. 
the board didn't have a majority minority until this year. Isn't it interesting that now within the Republican Party in power, for so many years within the county delegation and the school board decides now is the time to call for nonpartisan board of election, board of election elections, board of education elections. Two issues cited by the parents last week that I wanted to touch upon, cited as the basis for movement to nonpartisan elections, which both are non sequiturs. The mask policy, which is not decided by the board, elected board members, it's a superintendent decision, as well as being arrested at school board meetings, also an operational decision made exclusively by the superintendent. The third issue of board meetings being political is driven entirely by activist parents who were here at this meeting today and spoke last week, continuing to spew hatred and divisiveness. It is no coincidence that the parent speakers last week included two parents arrested for cause at the November meeting and two others noted for their extreme views and rhetoric, including one who regularly stalks board members and makes threatening comments at board meetings stating, we're coming for you. Bottom line, Senator Dixon respectfully put forth this legislation without following protocol on securing the consent of the local delegation. It's a thinly veiled attempt to ensure minority voices are not heard or in positions of power, and it must be stopped. Thank you. One, before we call our next speaker, uh, you know, one, one thing I'd like to clarify, uh, you know, yes, the city of Buford school system does lie within the district that I represent, but I also represent, uh, you know, the easiest way to put it is the, the northern third of Gwinnett County with many cities. And, you know, I would say the, the population, you know, that, that I represent is about 200,000 people and probably 90% of the folks that I represent that have children go to Gwinnett County Schools. So, I, you know, I've heard this, uh, you know, comment, you know, in committee meeting, you know, the past, uh, you know, uh, session that we had, the special session, and it's just, a, it, it makes no sense to me. I mean, I, I represent all my constituents, and 90% and of them have children. They do have children in schools or in Gwinnett County Schools. I just want to make that clarification because I have not so far. Uh, with that, I'll call our next speaker. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to make one comment as a former school board member to the, um, the presenter's thoughts about the superintendent related to mass policies and it wasn't a board decision. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I think the school board is responsible for adopting and passing policy, whether the superintendent is creating it or not. So if the school board is not um, involved in the policy making of the superintendent, that's, that's a board issue. That's not a superintendent issue. So. Just want to provide clarity for the public to that point. Any further uh, comments or, or questions from any of the other senators on the board? I see none. Uh, with that, I'll call our next uh, speaker, Angela Palm. Good morning. I'm Angela Palm. Director of Policy and Legislative Services for the Georgia School Boards Association. <clears throat> uh, GSBA has long had a position in support of legislation calling for the nonpartisan election of school board members. Um, and I, I will say that I'm speaking to a general bill, <clears throat> not local legislation. The association does not get involved in local legislation. And so if this committee recommends a general bill and that's what happens, then GSBA will be in support of that. If it becomes a local bill again, as where you started, that we will not be involved in that. And also just to explain where GSBA's positions come from, they come from our members, the 180 elected school boards around the state. Um, <clears throat> they have a, a meeting every year and they get to vote on our legislative positions and they have every year affirmed that they want to maintain this position. In addition to our position, I would also say that the 2008 report from the Commission on School Board Excellence, it was a statewide commission held um, to look at best practices for boards and what legislation might be needed. One of the recommendations around elections was that school board elections should be nonpartisan. That recommendation did not make it into the 2010 legislation, however, 
and so that is still not the case here in Georgia. Georgia law, however, has long allowed a local option for becoming nonpartisan. Um, in 1983, a statute was passed um, after the 1983 Constitution eliminated local constitutional amendments, and that statute would allow the local, uh, the nonpartisan election of school board members and superintendents who were still being elected at that time. After the 1992 constitutional amendment that required the election of all school board members and their appointing the superintendent, then a statute was put into place with the enabling legislation that said school board elections would be partisan unless there was a local legislation that changed it to nonpartisan, and that's where we are today. Currently, 109 of the 180 school boards are nonpartisan. It will be 110 if House Bill 745 is voted out of SLOGA, where it, come, where it is now. Um, it passed the House in the previous session, and so it's there. <clears throat> it's interesting that they can go from partisan to nonpartisan, and the reverse is true, and we have some that have flipped back the other direction. Um, so, Clearly, elections and how people are choosing to elect their boards is a reflection of the community. It's a reflection of how they choose to do things. So the one group may choose at one time to do it one way, and that other group chooses to reverse it and do it a different way. Our members are not naive. They're elected officials. They have sat through some very contentious meetings, um, as Senator Adam Tardy can attest. Um, they have been through difficult things just as all of you do. They aren't naive about the political process. They don't hold this position because they believe that it would make school board members a political or that it would solve every political crisis. They believe that this is the first step and that it would be a good positive step for school boards to take in order that the members come to the table without any tie to a party's agenda so that they can focus on the education of the students and make the best decisions without regard to that. It does not mean that they will be apolitical in their personal lives or that any of their beliefs will change. Um, as you move forward with this legislation, I would also encourage you to look at the effective date and you do it to make sure that it applies to a future election and does not overturn any city board members. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Hall? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I have one question. You said that the school, George School Board Association um, has called for a nonpartisan elections for, for a general bill. Does the Georgia School Board Association would be in favor of a nonpartisan election in a general bill if it only affects one county? If it only affects one county, in my estimation, that makes it a local bill, no matter what the legislative process is, it's fine. Thank you. Any other questions? And if you could uh, restate how many uh, school systems are nonpartisan in the state versus not. 100, yeah, 109 are nonpartisan, so 71 are partisan. And as I said, there's a bill uh, in SLOGO, which is a state and local government operations committee, um, to allow Washington County to become nonpartisan. It passed the House, but didn't get out of uh, the Senate committee last session. So you will still have that to work on when you go back in January. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, one comment, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Nikki Merritt, who's joined us today who's not a part of this committee, but she's in the audience. Thank you, Senator, for, for being here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to see you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'll now call Samaya Abdul. Good morning. My name is Sami Abdul and I am a parent of Gwinnett County Schools. I have a child who just graduated from Gwinnett County and in Georgia State, doing very well. And I have two other students who are honor students, one in Five Oaks Middle and one in Brooklyn High School. I just wanna speak first to my personal experience, but before I do that, I wanna thank you so much for bringing this to our local community. 
Um, I do know that we're in a very divisive um, state. Um, there's a lot of attention at the moment on Georgia, especially Gwinnett County. But I think we have to leverage our assets. Sometimes we figure out what is missing, but we really don't think about what is there working. So I want to caution you not to throw everything out in, in essence, because there is a lot happening in Gwinnett County schools. As a parent, my children are doing very well. I attend every school board meeting, that is. I do see and notice that our school board and superintendent have been really responsive to our schools, our students, our parents. I'm one of those parents that I feel that my children are getting what is needed from their schools. And it's very important to figure out and also notice that Gwinnett County is extremely diverse and a very large school system. So with that, I want us to look around at who's here and who's missing. There are a lot of voices that are missing out of these hearings. And those parents are real parents, and those students are real students that sometimes do not get the attention and not really engage, and every politics is local. What you are doing is very important, and I thank you for doing it. However, it's very important that you come to the parents and the community with data to justify the why, and also to tell us, no, to tell us what is it such sub subject matter experts, who are you talking to? Let them come to this podium and tell us exactly, because communities can decide for themselves. We are very engaged, educated community. We do know what's working for us. So it's important that local control starts with the local community. And when there is a state coming in, we need to understand the why that the state is coming in, because our communities can decide for themselves. We can actually sit down and figure out what's working for us, versus the state, and we've seen that in 2016 when the state came up to take the failing schools and the communities went and they voted and they took their schools back and those schools are functioning very well. So understand the logic and respect the communities and let us decide for ourselves. With our vote, let us decide because we have lived in a democratic state we do not believe in top-down approaches, we believe in bottom-up approaches. Our schools are working for us. If they're not working, we can sit down as a community and figure out what's not working for us and figure it out. So these are something that you need to consider. Local communities need local control. And the state has a lot to do. There's so many things for you all to do as far as supporting our schools financially, Figure out so many bills are on your table. So this, if it's, if you are proposing a takeover of our schools, let it be authentic and let us know that, okay? Put it on the ballot, let us go out and vote by 2016. But this looks like gerrymandering and playing with our children's lives for no apparent reasons, because partisan, schools can go from partisan to non-partisan, right? But the communities decide. There is no need for the states to come in, right? And allow a small portion of our community to have voice and the rest of those communities who do not speak the language, who are not engaged, who are working three jobs, when the pandemic reasons, the state. So right now, there's so many things for you all to do. But right now, this people here in this podium are a small drop of those communities that you are trying to decide for. And that is really harmful to this community at the moment. And I'm afraid that you do more damage to our schools versus none. So at the moment, from a parent's perspective, I do know that my school board is functioning very well from my eyes and what I see. I attend every school board meetings. I feel I'm informed and engaged. Um, I do see that the parents get an inputs. Respectfully, tonight, my child, 11-year-old, will be speaking. And all the children will go in the front of the meeting, so there is a, a student voice, and then the parents will go in. We get our three minutes in order. So I just wanted you to understand local decisions are for local people. And not every, there's no one size fits all. What fits the cap might not fit Gwinnett, what fits Gwinnett might not fit. So I'm, again, 
bring in out this idea of local control, and I do not think that you're doing the local control. I think you're maybe proposing a state takeover, and if that's the case, please put it out and let us go out vote. Put it on the ballot and let it be transparent. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any questions or comments from any of the senators? Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tamara Scott. Good morning, again, I'm Tamara Scott. I'm a parent of an up and coming Gwinnett County student and I have a freshman at Shiloh High School. And this is my first time speaking, so please forgive my nervousness. Um, I do want to clarify, um, the gentleman with this at the, the end said that the GCPS mask policy was one that the board voted on. I think a judge, Judge Fluker, ruled um, that the um, superintendent's policy would stand. It wasn't the board's policy. Um, one thing I want to say is I'm, I'm here for the first time to speak because um, I see more and more the divisiveness that is coming, is bubbling up with the school board. Um, especially once the pandemic hit and there was a discussion about mask policies. Folks had very um, passionate arguments against them and for them. But I hope that everyone understood that what was being done and requested was to keep children safe. Not as an adversary, but I want your child to be safe the same way I want my child to be safe. So fast forward now to the discussion about changing the composition of the school board. I, I'm still not hearing from anyone how this benefits our students, how it will protect our students, how it enriches the education of our students, because that's what the board's function is. I understand that some people may feel like they're not represented. The demographics of the county have changed. The Chamber of Commerce promoted for years and years that Gwinnett was this welcoming, diverse community. And once that diversity began to change the minority to the majority and vice versa, that's when it feels like this change has become problematic for some. And that simply is not the case. We all can find a common ground. We all will find a common ground because we all want our students to matriculate through GCPS and to be successful in the future. Again, if this proposal somehow improves what our children get in the classroom, if it improves and advances the funding that our schools get, if it helps my tax paying dollars to go further, then certainly who wouldn't support it, but I have not heard that argument. It feels like a partisan attempt to take over the board. And that is what many of us feel is disingenuous. If we know the why, behind this entire effort, why it was proposed when it was, why it's still, it's open for discussion now. There are several folks here who I've seen speak at board meetings before. Folks are very passionate. I think we all want what's best for our students, but I don't know how one more board member changes the dollars that go to a school to help that school have the resources that they need. I don't see that math. It's going to cost Gwinnett County taxpayers to support more board members, to support a higher, a, a larger local government. That is not going to help my student articulate. I also want to um, say, and I think I said before, we're not adversaries. We have to find a common ground. Gwinnett County is very diverse. All of the citizens of Gwinnett County need to have their voice heard. So I appreciate this opportunity to come and speak for the first time. And I certainly believe it will not be my last time. I want everyone to um, keep in mind, this should be a local decision. We should decide for ourselves if we are unhappy with the board as it stands. It is a well-functioning board. 
I heard the speaker say earlier, some boards have gone from nonpartisan to partisan, and they've gone the reverse. I have not heard anyone say how that benefits the students. We're here for our students, we're here for our communities, and I don't want anyone's voice to be louder than another. That's not fair and it's disingenuous if you present it as anything other than that. I'm here for the first time. I hope to encourage others to come and speak out if that's what they so choose to do. But I know the dollars and the cents don't make any sense. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, just wanted to clarify that uh, the, this committee is, is solely tasked with looking at uh, you know, taking the school boards from non or partisan to nonpartisan, it, it has nothing to do with increasing the size of the school board or the number of members. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other further comments or questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ma'am, thank you for being here. Thank you for your comment. Um, so, uh, as I understand, during your comments, you don't think that whether it's a partisan or nonpartisan election, this will not affect the quality of students and the quality of education for the students in Gwinnett County or, or any other county? Sorry, I'm going to hear this fine. I don't see the connection. I, don't, I think it's a distraction and it's a disruptive exercise at this point. There's no cause to disrupt a well-functioning board at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? I see none. Our next speaker is Diane Fisher. If you would please come to the microphone. Thank you. My name is Diane Fisher. I'm speaking to you today as a 21-year resident of Petrie Corners in Gwinnett County, an educator who works with high school students, the parent of two graduates of Gwinnett County Public Schools, as well as a leader of the League of Women Voters of Gwinnett County. As you know, the League is a nonpartisan organization that is committed to expanding voter participation and ensuring that all Americans have a voice in civic life. For years, I've heard state legislators preach about the importance of local control. In fact, they gave local counties the ability to decide how they want to conduct school board elections. Some counties chose nonpartisan elections, and others chose a partisan model. Counties have the ability to change their election structure if they believe a new approach is needed. But here we are having the state trying to assert control over counties, claiming that they know what is best for our communities. I ask you not to silence the voices of voters by making a statewide decision about our local elections. As they have in every election, the citizens of Gwinnett chose people they wanted to represent them at the ballot box. They did so following long established rules. It seems like a vocal minority is unhappy with the outcome of those elections and wants to alter the rules in response. Voting for the candidate of your choice in regularly scheduled elections is a way to address the dissatisfaction that does not require imposing sweeping statewide change. There's a place to have a discussion about the value of nonpartisan school board elections, but it is in the county seat, not at the state legislature. I am also concerned that while this committee is charged with making changes statewide, all the focus seems to be on Gwinnett. The fact that almost all of those who spoke at last week's meeting spoke about Gwinnett, and here we are in Gwinnett County for the only other scheduled public meeting, leaves other counties being put in the middle of what seems like a local concern. I want to recall the good citizens of Lanier, Hart, Glen, or Berrien County feel about having the state changing their partisan school board elections in response to politics in Gwinnett. Redistricting and the election changes implemented in SB 202 will make it challenging enough for organizations like the League to educate voters about how, where, and for whom they vote. Adding this solution in search of a problem will only add to what, we already, what will already be a confusing election season. The more unnecessary changes we make to elections, the more difficult it is for voters to vote. And, that, and isn't that our goal, to have the people elect representatives who will address their interests and needs? During last week's committee meeting, I heard hysteria about how school board members needed to be stopped from bringing their political agenda to our schools. A school board that makes decisions to ensure that all students are educated in a way that allows them to be safe, seen, and respected is not political. It is good educational policy. We live in polarized times when everything from public health to the presentation 
a factual history is politicized. If this study committee truly wants to take politics out of the schools, they will stop using our school boards and students as pawns in an effort to protect political power. As we meet today, the students, teachers, administrators, and staff of our schools are not thinking about politics. They are engaged with learning, even as we talk about them in political terms. They are taking final exams, completing projects, presenting engaging lessons, preparing and serving nutritious meals, and planning for a strong finish to the end of the semester. Let them and our school boards focus on educating all of our students without having to focus time and energy on the state inserting themselves in a place it doesn't belong. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Our next speaker, uh, Esther, I can't read the last name. Esther, yes, if you come forward, thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for having this. Uh, my name is Esther Dunn. My husband and I have two sons in the Gwinnett County school system. I am here because of them and their cousins who are also in the school system. My journey here started way back in high school, during the beginnings of the PC and relativism movement. I felt the culture change in my school. It was palatable. I could taste it and it felt like a heavy blanket draped over the soul of the school. It was confusing to me, not only because it was a new idea, but because it felt like it was out of place in school. As a teenager, I knew this was not right, and I wish that the adults in my life knew enough to do, um, to do something about it, because I was a kid. But it, to no fault of their own, they had other responsibilities and focus, which time would not permit me to get into. I said all this to point out that as a teenager in high school, I did not identify as a Democrat or a Republican, as a liberal or conservative. I was just a girl going to school to learn, make friends, participate in activities, and just plain old have fun. But the politics of the day started encroaching into that sacred space where it had no business being. Like I was back then, my two sons are neither Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative. This is not something that they think about at any point in their lives at the moment. As much as I don't like to assume, I will assume in this case that they go to school for the same reason I went to school as a young girl, to learn, make friends, participate in activities, and just have fun, though the order, of, though the order might be different because they're young boys and they want to have fun first. The point is, politics is not on the list, nor should it be for those we elect to the school board. In my opinion, anyone running for the position must love kids want the best for them, and be willing to partner with parents. Partnership with parents is very, very important in this equation because nobody loves my kids more than I do. This, is my, this, in my opinion, must be the driving force. Else why is anyone running? And allow me to rant for a second. I also believe that if anyone who is a candidate for the school board uh, member and has a kid, that kid should attend that same county that they're going to be represented. That's just my opinion. But it is clear to anyone who's paying attention that this system that we have right now is pretty much broken. I know others have come up and say everything is running smoothly. I'm one of those people that don't believe that that's happening. It's a broken system that we have right now. And I don't know too much about nonpartisanship because that's something that I am researching. But if it's an approach that will help, I'm all for it. So I have thoughts about this as I do my research. Thoughts like if 
I mean, I don't really know the nuances of it. If a person is a Democrat, they still have that same mindset and view and that would still come in. But I feel that if a person is running on a nonpartisan, um, on a nonpartisan non um, platform, at least in that case, they can fight for what they are running for, as opposed to having the L and the D next to their name and people just go down the list and check that this is what I'm voting for. I also feel like it would help us as a community to be better informed because now we are going to research the candidates that we are voting for, as opposed to just voting for the L or the D. It will help us as a community to, to be better informed, we'll, be, we'll do better research, and I think in that way we'll get better people to come into the schools to represent our children. Right now, as a mother in the Gwinnett County system, I don't really feel represented. I may look like the minority in, in, the, in the system, but I'm a minority in the way that I think, and I don't feel represented. And I don't feel that the school board is operating in a way that it should right now. It is very partisan. It is very political. I also do go to the school board meetings and I see what's happening. And parents' voices are not being heard. I'm one of those parents. I don't feel our voices are being heard. I don't feel like the school board is, oh, I get it that there's diversity and all that stuff, but I don't feel like parents' voices are being, every parent's voices are being heard as they should be. And that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do you have any questions or comments for the speaker? I see none, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll now call Rebecca Smith to the podium. Rebecca Mitchell, is that? I wrote uh, Rebecca Smith. I think I wrote it if I'm sick. So I mentioned to the young lady beside you that Rebecca Mitchell, state senator, was wanted to speak today. She was exposed to COVID yesterday. Sent me her comments and asked if I could just read them. And I asked earlier. Oh, that absolutely. Was, okay. Please do. So that. sorry, Rebecca Thank Mitchell. Thank you. Sorry. So these comments are exclusively on behalf of State Senator Rebecca Mitchell. Rebecca. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to voice my opinion in this hearing. Apologies for not being in person due to potential COVID exposure. I believe the original objective of this committee was addressing whether all school boards should be nonpartisan rather than a referendum on Gwinnett County Public Schools, which would of course be a local issue and led by a majority of delegation. I went home from the first meeting and thought about what I would need to see from that discussion to feel it was thorough. I cannot become an expert in the impact of board partisanship in a six day interval, even if I am provided with all the scholarship on this point. But I can take that time to educate myself on what the school boards themselves want and what impact of change would have. So I did that. There are around 70 partisan school boards currently serving our children in Georgia. I reached out to the public email addresses for school board members in the districts listed as currently being partisan on the Georgia School Board Association website. There was only one partisan school board on that list for which I could find zero email addresses, and there were only a handful for which I could not find all the addresses. I asked them how they felt. I received responses thus far from board members from all across the state, counties including Barrow, Chattooga, Cherokee, Cobb, Dawson, Gordon, Newton, Polk, Taylor, Thomas, and Washington. There were several anonymous responses, and I also received emails from several individuals who did not want to fill out the survey but did have a position. There were five questions, and I will email the data to you, Rebecca. It was sent out Monday evening and Tuesday morning. One, should school board partisanship remain a local issue? Two, would moving all school boards to nonpartisan be your preference? 
Three, would moving all school boards to nonpartisan be disruptive? Four, what would you like your school board, would you like your school board to be nonpartisan? And would moving your school board to nonpartisan be disruptive? Among the responses received thus far, there was no clarion call for this action in this moment. There were even completely opposite opinions within the same board. There were boards who currently have legislation in draft or previously submitted a draft for their own district to move to nonpartisan elections, and there were passionate advocates for boards remaining partisan. Those passionate responses were from both sides of the aisle. Overall, of the responses received thus far, the majority of respondents believe that school board partisanship should remain a local issue, 59%, while the submitted replies to all other questions are split nearly equally. Board members have had only two days to answer this email, but I would encourage you to actually go talk to school board members themselves and share the data from experts with us here. Freedom to make our own decisions about what is best in our local communities is a core concept of Georgia law. Unlike public health, this is a local issue that should be addressed by local delegations representing the will of the majority within their own local districts. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Call the next speaker, uh, Dean Snyder. Hello. My name is Dina Snyder. Um, 24 year uh, citizen here at Gwinnett County. I've had one child go through Gwinnett County school systems, and I have one that has three more semesters. Whenever a child um, turns 18, they get a seat at the board on on the board of two very important corporations. One is the state government and the other is the federal government. Few are prepared to take on this responsibility and fewer know why it's important. Parents and schools are responsible for this preparation. Elections do have consequences, but we only have one chance at raising our children and educating them. How do we get to such a politically polarized time as today? Frankly, I believe it's by design. We have forgotten the power given to we the people via the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. We've forgotten that the great risks and the wars that were taken place, that, take, that were taken place in our nation's history to ensure a government is properly restrained and protects the rights we were all born with. But yet here we are. In the current environment, it appears to me that our own government works harder to divide the people of our nation than they do to protect our freedoms and prosperity. It seems like we are all about identity politics and fighting ideologies. Even though every elected leader is sworn to uphold the same constitution, we no longer can look to our leaders as a whole to protect our rights but we have to look to those leaders around us who we most closely identify. In a, in a time of severe controversy, we should be able to look at our elected officials for a resolution, an attempt to find the middle ground, a negotiator, but unfortunately, if you disagree with politics or rhetoric that a certain leader has, you are looked at as a dissenter, an insurrectionist, or even a domestic terrorist. Our current school board here in Gwinnett County is on the extreme spectrum of the political scale, which is what has gotten everyone's attention. They came in during a very uncertain time with a pandemic, and they fired, <coughs> excuse me, our superintendent, which appeared very odd, since common sense would say consistency was so needed during this time of unknowns. They brought in a superintendent that has a very checkered past in a much, much smaller school system in Washington State. He was given a vote of no confidence in Washington after his inability to balance a budget after five years. He accepted payment from a vendor with whom the school was contracted with. Unfortunately, I don't think that our school board was interested in his experience or successes when hiring him. The consequences are still being felt by his last school district as they had 55,000 children pulled from their enrollment. 
We need to be focusing on our children, not politics, nor extreme agendas like CRT, SEL, equity learning. Our children deserve better. The board is not willing to work with parents that disagree. They have weaponized our SROs, the same ones they want to take out of our schools. For a show of power, they spent taxpayer money to don our ISC building with metal detectors. But mind you, they're not at the front doors, but rather halfway down the hall towards the school board meeting room. So that expensive hunk of metal is only used one time per month for about 30 minutes. When the majority of our school board has, brought, has been brought up on ethics violations, one even being referred for a hearing now because of her second and third violations. These are the same people in charge of a $2 billion budget. They weaponize masks, which have done nothing to keep our kids healthy because they have nothing to do with health. Our case counts have spiked in the beginning of the semester despite wearing masks, and they have come down to next to nothing. This is simply the way viruses behave. They mutate. They become more contagious and less dangerous, waxing and waning. We need our school board to focus on education, looking at learning barriers, as well as gifted programs, and make sure that every child is prepared for a career or college, and they can reach their full potential. We do not need our school boards to experiment with our children, especially not with Marxist agendas. They need to stay in their lane. Our schools are not mental health institutions, and they should not act like it because they are not equipped. The board's extremism is why we need to keep political parties out of school board elections for the sake of our children, our communities, and our home values. We need people to be elected for the desire to improve schools for our children and the leadership qualities to be able to work with parents, teachers, and administrators to help our schools be the best they can be. I never want to go to a school board again and have the experience of a complete stranger walking up to me and calling me a white supremacist for simply not wearing a mask. This rhetoric begins with our school board, and we all know that because we've seen the videos and the written comments. Our children in our schools should never be used as a political stepping stone, a base camp for liberal ideologies, because our children are too important. Serving on a school board should be reserved for those that have a passion for children, education, and community. No one should need out-of-state money to run for a local school board. All they need is their character, willingness to serve, and desire to work hard for all children. We always need to focus on education of the child and not politically driven indoctrination. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Thank you very much. I'll call our next speaker, Mason Snyder. have input and someone to hear my voice on something that directly affects me. So I come here today not as someone who has sided with any kind of political party, but as a student that of the student of the system that this legislation directly affects. On the topic of partisan school board elections, I feel it's unwise to keep. Studies have shown that partisan school board elections increase turnout, but what's an increase to turnout if no one knows what they're voting for? Nonpartisan elections encourage voters the voter to know what will actually happen to their child's education. I feel it's immoral to elect, to elect the people in charge of our future because they have a nice Republican or Democrat seal of approval. If we really cared about our students of our school system, wouldn't we do research on what actually benefits our school and our students? My peers deserve more than a mindless vote without hesitation. In an effort to give my peers what they deserve, I implore you to do research on what you best think benefits your child, and then vote for it. 
I don't think partisan has anything to do with what my peers deserve and how they should be educated. If this, this will only work if we do our jobs as voters. We the people as a community cannot just celebrate the passing of the legislation and then move on to the next hot button issue. The status quo of voting down party lines is directly impactful to students and it's harmful to them. I feel it's a disrespect to me and my peers and our future when voters find out who they're voting for when they get to the polls. I have faith that this legislation will do this legislature will do their part. But this isn't the end of this issue. I would say it's far from over. Just just not voting at all or voting at random because you don't know who to choose doesn't solve the issue present at hand. We must know who we want in charge of our peer, of my peers' education. I know that information like this isn't readily available on cable news, but it must be actively searched for. But I feel the time spending spent investing in our future and researching who we want in charge of our children and my peers is worth every cent. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Thank you for speaking. Appreciate it. You did a great job, by the way. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Chairman Everton Blair. Thanks, Senator Dixon. Um, and thank you, Senators, for coming to Gwinnett to have this uh, meeting. Uh, I think I want to preface my comments with just a little bit of an educational moment. Um, because there are folks that are referring to the school board, and I just want to reiterate that that board is comprised of just five people. And when we make decisions that impact which of those five people are elected, when, and how, um, I think it's really important to leverage the perspectives of those five people. Um, with respect to the nonpartisan study, um, I'm wondering where the study is. Um, and what the remainder of this process and effort will yield in terms of uh, expert opinion, testimony, research, or perspectives from the school board members in the 180 school systems across this state. Um, as you can see, there's not a very clear issue one way or another on whether or not school board elections should be partisan or not. Um, and frankly, there are benefits to both. Um, and I think you would even find that there would be bipartisan support for either decision were we to actually go the route that is currently available, which is local legislation to make this sort of a decision. Um, it bothers me that we would use Gwinnett County as a wedge to create and stoke um, decisions that would have an impact on 70 uh, local school systems across the state um, because we have the capacity within our county to make these decisions. Um, that said, I also feel like there's a lot of overstated scrutiny placed on the board for what is actually two and a half hours a month. And to be a school board member is much more time, much more investment, as I'm sure some of you know, um, than the monthly board meeting that occurs for us on the third Thursday of every month. Um, we meet constantly. We build relationships with each other um, pretty much daily. Um, as a chairman, I spend probably 20 hours on the phone just with either the superintendent or members of the governance team alone. Um, so I think, Jermaine, specifically to what we're trying to solve, um, partisanship or not, these rules were put in place by Republicans that preceded any member of this board. Um, and, and I think we have to be mindful of the rationale behind why suddenly this change is seeming like it needs to occur. Whether or not it happens, um, I think it's important to recognize the unintended consequences that might happen with any decision we make. Um, one is money and politics. People have shared that uh, there's a concern around how much influence a particular candidate might have because of the, the funds that they're able to generate. Um, and I think, honestly, nonpartisan elections exacerbate that reality uh, because the electorate is smaller, because it is easier to send mail to a smaller group of people. Uh, money stretches further. And, and if you do have a situation where there's less information widely available on candidates based on their party identification, then you're basically going on the strength of who's able to reach you and who's able to give you information, who has the nicer website, who has the flashier mail, who has the digital ads. Um, and these are, I think, uh, aspects that will be 
more difficult to overcome, even if you do have a better candidate who is less funded, if you choose to make nonpartisan elections. Um, another consequence is just the kind of lame duck scenario, where if you move the nonpartisan election to May, uh, you then have several more months whereby the, um, the candidate elect has not yet taken or as assumed that office. Um, but you've got board members who are just kind of there. Um, and we saw what happened when our past board chair had lost her election and was disgruntled at the result and chose to kind of go out and uh, make really nasty comments about their fellow board members. Um, I think that there's a little bit of a connection between not feeling empowered to serve your constituents there and there being a long lag between when your last day actually takes effect but the reality that your community has given you a vote of no confidence um, and wishes not to have you continue to represent them. Especially this time though, I think because we're under the throes of a redistricting effort and we do not yet know what the district lines even look like, the qualifying period and then the subsequent time crunch between that qualifying period and when a nonpartisan election would occur, I think creates an undue burden. And, and, and what I think at least lead us to consider uh, delaying this, any legislation, frankly, that we don't have to take at this point, which really should just be focused on redistricting, to be delayed until 2024. Um, simply because the district lines that have not yet been set and will be taken up in general session, I think will have an impact on who qualifies where, who even knows what districts they're voting on that year, and then the quick turnaround there, right? We don't have about two months to choose who would be the successive representative um, in, in any of these districts. I think that the last thing I want to do is just call into question what the rationale is for the decisions that we're making and what problem we're actually trying to solve. It's ostensible and it's laudable, and I completely agree that if we could take the po politics out of school board issues, I think we would be better off. I think that the reality, though, is pragmatically, it's not that simple. Um, I also think that the issues that are being addressed are very, very specific to Gwinnett County. And the division is not on our school board. The five of us get along. Um, I talk to my colleagues every day, and Republican, Democrat, all of them, old, young, black, white, everybody has the ability to break bread and to share their thoughts in an open and transparent way. Um, most of the division, honestly, that we see is in the room. And, and that's something that we have to do a better job at honoring and recognizing. We have had the conversation about how ineffective our public comment is. Um, I'll be the first to say that we can do a better job at making sure that people realize that that's a space where we're supposed to be talking about the business of the school system on that day. It's public comment about that board meeting. And so I regret that folks feel like their voices are not being heard in that space. And there are multiple avenues where folks can take their very serious claims and have them be known, particularly at their local school. Uh, but we also have to be mindful that when we have spots for 30 people to speak, that will never be representative of the 180,000 students in our county, nor the over 250,000 parents in our community. Um, and so it is intrinsically a very difficult proposition to say that the board meeting is the reason for us to take sweeping change over how school boards are elected and governed across this state. Um, I implore us all to be much more mindful about taking sweeping action, particularly at a divisive time, because of the unintended consequences, I mean, I look forward to a continued study that actually takes into account the opinions and perspectives of sitting local school board members before taking action to change how they're constituted or elected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any comments or questions, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Blair, what's your opinion of local control? Strong. Uh, I mean, we have local legislation bylaws that allow for this very conversation and decision to happen. Um, I think you would find that there is bipartisan support from senators and uh, representatives in the Gwinnett delegation for nonpartisan elections. Um, there was that support when Republicans were in power. Um, I think that the remaining members of the delegation who uh, would have had that opinion then might still have it now. It's a worthwhile conversation to have with the existing process on the books. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, sir. I appreciate you showing up today. Um, you mentioned you engage the other school board members. How many hours a week do you feel like you, as the chairman, do you feel like you engage the other school board members in 
in healthy conversation or just have dialogue, as you mentioned? What, what does that look like as a, as a chairman? Um, at least at least 20 hours just on the phone and via email. Um, and then we have the kind of nightly events that will occur in different communities where it might not be all five of us or even a quorum, but we would have a select two uh, that, and I would interact with any of them. Um, I speak to the superintendent daily. Um, and yeah, there's not a, there's not a two day period that goes by where I haven't spoken to at least two board members. And can you talk, I appreciate that. And can you talk about like, what, what, are, what are the rules of engagement for your public comment process at your school board member meetings? I know when I was on the school board, we adopted annual rules of engagement policies that are transparently posted on the website. I think we read them out loud at each meeting um, to help ensure that members of the community aren't you know, we're not picking and choosing who walks in the door, because I know everything that, you know, we, I think we try to aspire to have sunshine out on our school board meetings. Can you talk about just a little bit, what, is, what does that look like with your school board? Yeah, and uh, I'll say very transparently once again that I think the policy needs to change again. Um, what we used to do was uh, come one, come all. And we had a, a portion reserved at 6.15 before the business meeting where we have about 45 minutes for folks that just didn't have the time to sign up in advance but showed up and wanted to say something. Um, it was rarely used, interestingly. I don't think people, many people knew about it. Um, and then we shifted that policy. Oh, and then, sorry, at the 7 o'clock time, then we would, after we conducted our business, allow an unlimited number of speakers to speak for uh, up to five minutes, but typically it was three, and then if you had more than 40 people, we would truncate that time for two minutes each. Um, we changed the policy to allow for just 30 people to speak for three minutes each, um, which was in accordance to the, the legislation which required at least 30 minutes of public comment. We exceeded that by allowing 90 minutes, uh, but it was first come, first serve. Um, and people know when that time frame opens, and those spots are taken in about five minutes every month. Um, it's not good. Uh, I think we need to do a better job at either lottering those spots or creating a greater pool whereby we can hear from a wider uh, constituency, uh, inclusive of our teachers and our students in our system. Um, we're exploring an opportunity with our current superintendent to figure out additional ways to get input because the reality is, I think that the community is, is wanting a little bit more community forum sort of spaces, kind of like your, your local school council or your parent nights. Um, and I think we just as a board have explored going to those spaces rather than having people come to us, um, as well as uh, potentially creating a live stream or a virtual option that allows us to more readily and frequently engage. Um, the reality is these are things that we take into account because we're hearing um, the feedback from the community. And, and we're able to do that, but I don't think it has anything to do with partisanship or the issues that we're potentially trying to solve, and I'm concerned about the, the incoherence of the issues. Well, I appreciate that too. Thank you for sharing that. One more question I had was, since we're here to talk about whether school boards across the state, you know, should remain Republican, Democrat, or nonpartisan, do you, as the school board chairman, engage with both the chairman of the Democratic Party in Gwinnett County and the Republican uh, chairman? Do you sit down and have conversations with them about what's going on in the classroom, what's going on in the school district, whether that could regarding curriculum, safety, you know, just you know, uh, student population in terms of um, you know the size of our schools, budgets. Those things, like, do you sit down with those party leaders of both parties and have these conversations as the chairman? No, I actually don't have those conversations with either of them. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Question, Mr. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chairman Blair, um, do you think whether an election is partisan or nonpartisan, do, do you think it affects the quality of education for students in Gwinnett County or the quality of uh, teachers? Uh, that provide that uh, direction and, and leadership? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, the, I think that there's a principle, an ethos around the question that makes us feel like if, a, if an election is nonpartisan, then it strips the labels from how we identify in terms of party. Um, I've seen nonpartisan elections yield good candidates. I've seen partisan elections yield good candidates. I've seen the reverse occur in both. Um, I don't think that it's 100% attributable, nor is it the single greatest deciding factor in what the, what the quality of the representative is. 
Um, and I, I think the greater concern with this legislation, which perhaps we might be able to address, is um, that the election occurs in May instead of November. Um, and so municipalities that run their own independent school systems that do not have November general elections, but they're in off years, if we were to pursue an option that allowed for nonpartisan elections but created a scenario where the elect the turnout was the greatest, then I think you would have the greatest um, likelihood of folks electing the best representatives. Um, you know, frankly, from my perspective, I think I would fare well in a nonpartisan or a partisan election, so I can only speak for myself there. Um, and, and I think in general, uh, there are, it doesn't necessarily matter. If I may, Mr. Chairman, so that seven, eight months lag uh, would definitely have a negative outcome because those uh, people that's in office that will just sit there, they may have a negative opinion or be upset. Yes, but you all have the power to change that too. Uh, the, the May election <laughs> could take effect earlier, and those people could be sworn in earlier, and we could change the cycles. Um, whatever that decision is, though, I think it needs to be delayed because we do have a lot of redistricting related efforts right now that are going to obfuscate both the ability to change the lines and for people, for candidates, and for people to be able to elect those candidates um, in such a short time frame. Um, I'm concerned about our local board of elections, which will now be switching lines and moving timelines up. Um, and I think that there's also a lot of miseducation around nonpartisan ballots. Folks go in thinking that they need to pull a nonpartisan ballot in order just to vote for school board, not realizing that you can pull the party primary ballot and still have those races on your ballot. There's just a lot of moving parts here that we have to make sure people are informed about before we would take such sweet, sweeping action. Second, my last question, sir. Isn't it true that Gwinnett County School System is one of the best school systems in our state right now? I mean, I had a tremendous experience in Gwinnett County Schools. It's what afforded me so many opportunities and why I came back. Can I ask one more question? If I may, Senator Jackson, just real quick, piggybacking off of your comments. So if I hear you right, nonpartisan election in November, you think it would drive more people, potentially would have some benefits. You don't currently talk to the Republican Party chair, the Democratic chair. Am I hearing that you would, you really believe a nonpartisan pathway makes more sense? Because that's what it kind of sounds like. I think that we need to make sure that we're solving the right problem by doing what we can. If I have no problem with nonpartisan elections, to be clear, my problem is the timing and the uh, resultant lag and the lower uh, electorate, the lower turnout electorate. If we can solve all of those things, then I think you would find a unitarian set of support around this issue. Uh, this is also just to share a little bit of context how I treat all of the issues before our board. Um, people have really strong opinions about things. We come together, we hash it out, and we do that well. Um, our board does not have a partisan issue on the board as it's pr presently constituted. Um, and it's because we work together in this way. If we were to take the good faith effort with even this study committee and bring in the people who are currently serving on local boards to get their perspectives and opinions, and then figure out if there is a solution that everybody could trust and move forward with, I think that would be a good move. But to make this sweeping change on the basis of certain disgruntled folks in Gwinnett County specifically across the entire state, um, I think is disingenuous. Thanks, man. Thanks, Shelby. And I just got one question. So if, if uh, the election was moved from, from May to November and then it, you know, the nonpartisan um, election process wouldn't start until 2024, would you be in favor of, of this legislation? Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? Our next speaker is Holly Terry. I wanted to first start off by sharing a personal experience working on a campaign 
um, in 2020, I uh, supported an independent writing contract or an independent write-in candidate for District 5. Um, and to my surprise, on election day, November 2020, I was standing outside a polling location holding my candidate sign, waving and doing the typical thing when Therese Johnson, um, who now serves on the board in District 5, showed up. And to my horror, as someone who loves democracy and, and the sake of democracy, witnessed our, our District 5 board member go up to cars that were pulling into the polling location and over and over and over again say, just vote, vote blue. Vote blue straight down the ticket. You don't need to know who I am. Just vote blue. Over and over and over again. That was my first inkling that we have a serious problem. Uh, that, that this candidacy was not being run off of policies, but simply the coattails of a party. Um, during my work in that campaign, I uh, interacted with a lot of people, specifically from District 5, um, from door knocking through text messaging, um, a lot of exchange. And what was interesting, I'll use this as an example, one of the, uh, the policies that um, our two board members, Therese Johnson and Karen Watkins, ran their campaigns on was the removal of SROs from our schools. Um, interestingly enough, Chairman Blair in uh, June of 2020, hot in the middle of the campaign season, tweeted that he fully supports eliminating all SROs from schools and decriminalizing education. Hopefully one day I'll have some colleagues who agree. Um, and sure enough, that was one of the key points that these two uh, women were running their campaign sign. Now what was interesting, when I was working in District 5 and I was interacting with people, I would present with them this particular issue. Did you know that your representative, this potential representative for District 5 wants to remove SROs from our schools? And a resounding, no, no, I do not want that to happen. These were Democrat voters saying, no, they do not want SROs removed from their schools. However, they were uninformed and didn't take the time to really look at the candidate because they admittedly vote blue straight down the ticket. So it was an eye-opening experience, not only for me, but for those that I interacted with, as to the dangers of why, uh, especially in local elections, we do not vote down the ticket. We vote based off of policy. Procedures. What are, you, what are your plans for GCPS, such as removing SROs from our schools? So to reiterate, I witnessed, and, and there's even a, um, a since-deleted TikTok video of our current board member hanging out the side of a truck in a Walmart parking lot screaming, vote blue, vote blue, vote blue. It's disturbing to me because all of these board members, they make decisions that affect our entire school district, no matter what area you live in. So with that being said, I, another issue that um, was disturbing to me that they were running their campaigns on was the removal of Will Banks, Superintendent Will Banks. And the rhetoric that was being pushed was that he was a racist. Oh, excuse me. Let me just back up. During that time working that polling location, and I was holding my independent candidate sign, I was given a thumbs up by a car driving down the road. And when I shouted back a jovial, hey, 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 Therese Johnson turned around and ran up into my face and screamed, end white supremacy, over and over and over again. Because I was holding her competitor sign and that was equated as, I'm a white supremacist. And that is, that is the verbiage that we heard all through the election season of 2020. And it continued to be pushed uh, thereafter. 
So as I was saying, the same narrative was being pushed on uh, our superintendent, Will Banks, at the time. During campaign season, they were pushing that he would be removed because he was, quote unquote, a white supremacist. What was very interesting is in Cobb County, which is also a partisan school board, there was a copy and paste effort for their running elected partisan officials to accuse their superintendent of the exact same thing. It was so comical, it was to the point where the flyers that they were pushing were literally word for word the exact same accusations they had for our superintendent in Gwinnett County. The only difference is they swapped out the picture of the superintendent. So you have to think with the partisan elections, where are these ideas rooted from? Where are they coming from? Well, we know. We know that they are rooted in political party affiliation. Every party has an agenda that they wish to uh, see. Every party recognizes that uh, we are molding and shaping future voters. And we, we know that here in the state of Georgia, I believe it's one out of every, don't quote me, but I think it's one out of every 18 voters in the state of Georgia graduate from Gwinnett County Public Schools. It is a uh, very profitable area to run and win in a partisan election, especially a school board election. Um, so with that being said, uh, I do want to see as, uh, you know, as little government control as possible. I am a supporter of that. However, one of the things that we are not mentioning is the fact that um, when a county public schools is in trouble with an emergency accreditation review taking place by Cognia and significant amount of those complaints being rooted in rhetoric and actions and this constantly regurgitated verbiage from our de Democrat uh, elected officials that were running at the time and, and even now. That's where we got to this place. The, the complaints, the arguments, the, um, the things that Cognia had. <clears throat> I'll, I will quote US News and World Report. And it's quoted as saying that Gwinnett County School Boards must improve based off of the Cognia findings. And that's the national newspaper. Um, and again, these findings and the complaints were rooted in issues pertaining to this, this partisan dialogue, this partisan agenda. Um, I also want to state that Cogni took these, accusa these, these accusations or, or findings or, or whatever very seriously to the point that they had interviewed 124 employees, parents, and community members. And it was found, it was found that there were significant areas that Gwinnett County needed to improve on that once did not prior have issue before. Um, but going back to how a political agenda is being weaponized amongst parents and, and our school system, um, I, I hear a lot of people bringing up the mask issue. And, um, and we have even heard from some of our local, from our, our school board members that um, it is a political issue, which is very upsetting to me. Um, we have board members that have been quoted as saying, whites don't want masks and blacks want masks. And that Republicans want their children in school, but Democrats want their children at home. I even have a quote here from uh, Therese Johnson, mm -hmm. and it says, <clears throat> Most people who want schools open are white. And most of the informed people who want the schools open, want the schools closed, are black or brown. So tell me, how do I effectively advocate for my child's educational needs if I am already, before I open my mouth, being pitted against a party or against a skin color, or against a political ideology. I'm already being shut down 
because in the eyes of some of our board members who I firmly believe their allegiance is to a political party and not to our school system, where, where do I get to be heard? How does anyone get to be heard unless your, your uh, statements fully fit within the confines of a particular ideology? Um, <clears throat> Another thing that I found very interesting in all of this is when um, Chairman Blair was elected, one of the first things he did was change his social media to state, came home and flipped a partisan school board um, by 31 points with most votes ever. That's awesome. However, it gives me pause, and it should for you as well. Um, <clears throat> You know, we, we also discussed here about the donors that have been funneling money from out of state into our school board races. I find that very concerning. And, and listen, I know uh, everyone here in the room is very aware that this is not going to completely eradicate some of the issues that have taken place in our county and, and possibly in other counties by making the school board nonpartisan. But we fully believe that uh, it's a start. It is a start because I know more from my board members where they stand politically than what their goals are for my child. When the school board, when one of the first things that they do is to remove a successful superintendent of whom even Chairman Blair said he had a very um, beneficial experience coming from GCPS. I want the same experience for my child. I don't feel like that that is going to happen <laughs> with the way that we're going. But the first remo being the removal of our superintendent, claiming that they pay him too much, he's a vice supremacist and all the, the standard. Interestingly enough, they bring in a superintendent that conforms to their plans, their ideologies, and winds up paying him the same amount. That's very frustrating for parents like that, like me, that are subjected to that kind of rhetoric and in the end hire a superintendent that they're paying exactly the same amount, in addition to costing taxpayers $530,000 to finish out Alvin Wilbank's um, um, contract. <clears throat> Mrs. Terry, if you would wrap it up. We've got Absolutely. I, and now I'll leave it at there. The two hours. I'll Thank leave it so there. Much. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments? Uh, yes, ma'am. You said that, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the things you talked about as far as partisanship. Um, were there one or more candidate forums for the general election for the school board races, if you're aware of? Public, public candidate forums? I know, yes, because I watched a couple of them. One in particular that I remember was through the um, chamber. Mm -hmm. And were you permitted to attend and to ask questions? Or was the public, anybody in the public permitted to attend and ask questions? I'll be honest, I don't really remember because of COVID, um, but I know it was available to watch online. And the other one, uh, how do we better ed educate voters on the issues because I'm, I'm like you I think that we should stay focused on issues and I'm just chair of education and youth in the Senate. It's the first thing I said if we make this about kids mm -hmm. and not about ourselves sitting at the table mm -hmm. we can do some great things but as soon as it comes about us we lose our focus mm -hmm. so how in your view do you think we turn this back to about issues and solely about issues you know open forums where spoke, we speak specifically on um, policy. And um, when, we're, when candidates are running, they're running solely based off of policy, not uh, political endorsements, uh, riding the coattails of a party, or in my fear, um, being indebted to a party because of particular donations, because of particular endorsements. Um, <clears throat> And, and I do think, to a certain degree, that that has taken place. Um, so, again, my experience with working that campaign in particular was 
once once voters are I believe not given the option to just vote straight down the ticket that they would be forced to look at the issues um, whether people admit it or not if you are a registered Republican or Democrat to a certain degree you most definitely do vote straight down the ticket until you hit those local elections and you have to take the time to educate yourself and know who you are voting for are there those that uh, are Democrats and Republicans that are still going to take the time to figure out how that candidate lines up with a particular party and still allow that to sway their vote? Yeah, absolutely, but we all know that it is the independent vote that makes or breaks elections. Um, so I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Senator Nikki Mayer. I just want to ask one question. Chairman Blair, could you come up to the mic? I just want to ask you one quick question about board norms. I know we talked about this a little bit um, at the last meeting. In terms of, again, you know, how we create and cultivate that healthy conversation amongst the board, what, what have been your board norms? And, um, you know, we, to your board, when if somebody's out there on social make, media making over the top comments, how as a board do you govern yourselves or kind of in terms of the norms of you know what's appropriate or what what's not appropriate? I know as a school board member in many school boards, if not all the school boards in Georgia, we adopt these norms related to social media usage and things like that because of the sensitive nature. I think of being in the, the local elected role of a, of a board member. Can you talk about that just br very briefly? Yeah, um, it's an interesting yeah. question because we didn't have any. Um, when I joined the board, uh, we had not brought on a new board member 24 years previously um, and so many of our processes were kind of momentous and, and not scrutinized or interrogated for a couple decades um, but we did create some this year so there's we do have a process for um, having the conversation during our quarterly trainings um, how are we doing what are some things that we need to adjust um, it is up to the chair to point out where there's any violation among any board member uh, regarding any of our norms, having that first time violation or instance conversation with the uh, party involved. And then if there are subsequent measures thereafter, then we come together as a group. Um, if it's a repetitive occurrence, um, then we would move to either publicly censure um, or uh, create a, a plan with that board member. But um, we've not had that issue yet, and we passed our board norms two months ago. Um, okay, thank you. All right. Good afternoon, members. I'm always happy to see all of you. No, really. No, we actually do. We, for the most part, we get along. Now, we have some ideology differences, and that, that's kind of the thing that divides us, and some things are a little more touchy and hot than others, but on a whole, I am always glad to see them. You know, see us mulling around the chamber, we're all talking to each other, like, you know, and seeing each other in a while. But anyway, so I wanted to uh, just hit on a couple of points, uh, and some, some of these things have been brought up already. Um, I, I, Senator Nikki Merrick, for those that you don't know me, and I serve District 9. District 9 covers Decula, Lawrenceville, Snellville, Lilburn, and Grayson, where I live. My kids attended uh, Grayson High School. They graduated from there. I, you know, Gwinnett has great schools. People move here because we have great schools. And both of my kids are, they have graduated. I have a 20 and a 19 year old wife. Youngest is at Georgia Tech, and my oldest is at Georgia State. And, um, you know, during uh, uh, Superintendent Will Banks' tenure, he did a great job. And again, I think Gwinnett has good schools. And I think we still have good schools. And I have not seen any evidence to counter that. People are still moving here. In fact, so many people are moving here that my district grew, District 9, and I had to cut some of my districts. I served, I serve over 210,000 constituents. Uh, prior to redistricting, I had more than that, so I had to cut some, so on the new maps that is reflected. And of the 210 that I represent, I don't hear overwhelmingly 
complaints about our school board. I just don't. I get other complaints. People are worried about the economy. They're worried about food on their tables. Uh, our kids have returned back to schools and they need the support they need. Uh, they need the support in the schools and the resources to you know, have a quality education, to support our teachers, to support our students. These are the things they're worried about. But I do not hear from them that they have a problem with our school board. And it, it's not an overwhelming. Now, if I start getting them, but, you know, I, I'm going to check to see if you're in my district. But, uh, and, and I always encourage the public to let me know what's going on. And um, I think we have school board member, is she she left. Karen Watts is my uh, school board member in my district. Uh, that's the one thing I want to say. Um, Senator Dixon, I am the vice chair of our Senate delegation. That is our local body that local legislation should pass through if it is a local bill. I serve on the vice chair of the Senate delegation. Senator Dixon, Dixon is our secretary. We do have a process for local legislation. Uh, it is no secret <laughs> that I support that process and I always want us to follow that. And I know many of my colleagues in the Senate have very much been in a favor of local control in the past and still are. You know, I wouldn't want to come to their counties and start making widespread decisions without, I think they would have a problem with that. And even here in Gwinnett County, when we were majority Republican, everybody liked local control. But now we're on the flip side. And now local control doesn't seem to be sufficient. So whatever process or whatever changes we are going to make with the board, I um, recommend that we follow the local process. We use data, we use public input, and we find a fair and equitable way to move forward with any type of legislation that would have a say about the partisanship of our, of our board members. Um, the other concern that I have is we're trying to make a statewide change. We have, as it's been said, uh, what is it, 70, uh, part 70 partisan, 71 partisan school board. But we're only having a meeting in Gwinnett County. And the other one we had, it was down at the Capitol. I would need to see that we are having hearings in those counties, the other 71 counties that will be affected. I want to hear from those folks. I also encourage you to have these meetings at a time where my working parents and families can get to these meetings. 11 o'clock in the middle of the day is not a good time. People work, their kids are going to school. I mean, we have got to find a way to engage more people and do it at a time that they can get here and we can hear their input. Um, we have no data on if nonpartisan school boards are functioning better than partisan school boards. If someone has that data, please give it to me. I'd be, I'd be happy to review it. I haven't heard that here today. A lot of the parents I'm hearing speaking today, I, I, again, I don't hear overwhelming from my constituents, but I would be interested to know where most of you do live, and it's not a pick on you or anything. I'm just trying to get a, kind of get a gauge of where these are coming from. Here you remember from my district? Yeah, yeah I, got a D, I got one, but I haven't heard from you. Now, if you email me, I didn't see you or whatever, but now, hello, now you know who I am. Um, and I also want to, and I, I don't know if I'm running out of time. Um, I would like to see, and if this, is all, if this continues to be a thing, an issue, I'd always like to leave it to the people, and the people of Georgia, the people in each county. I would support it being a referendum on the ballot. Let's let the people decide. Let's the people in Georgia decide. We can even do it by county if, if, if it took that. But let's, let's hear from Georgia and see if they're in support of it. I think that's fair, and that's a fair ask. Leave it to the top. Always. That's why I ran. Voice of the people. I believe in the people. People elected me to be their voice, and I always believe we defer to them. 
because we work for all of you. Um, I do want to point out that this, as we're speaking about ballots, this question did come up on a ballot. On the um, Republican primary ballot in 2020, the question was question three. And it was, it stated, should candidates for Board of Education be required to declare their political party? This was on the primary ballot in 2020, on the Republican side. 65% said yes, statewide. 71% said yes, and that was Gwinnett. I find it interesting what has changed from 2020 20 to 2022. And the only common denominator I have is the school board changed. Prior to that, the, it was the reverse. The Democrats were, we had no one on the board, it was the majority Republican, we had no voice. And now it's interesting that it's been reversed. And now we have a problem. And now we want to push for nonpartisan when that wasn't an issue before. It's um, convenient. But again, I will support Senator Dixon, leaving it to the people always. Let's hear from more of them. Let's hear from more across our state, especially those that have been affected, that will be affected by this change. Even from my colleagues in those counties that would be affected by the change, I would like to hear what they have to say. And um, again, we can always leave it, leave, it as a, leave it as a statewide issue and see if we can get a referendum on it. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your comment. Can I ask her a question? Have you been to a school board meeting lately? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And, and the ones that I haven't been to, I watch them. So I am aware of what goes on there. So you're so, aware that there's a big political divide going on? I absolutely am. That's all I know. Yes, I am. Um, I think the last one that I was, I did go to, it was um, right after we went out of session. Mm -hmm. So it was May, June? I think it was June. And um, I just wanted to give like a session wrap up. And the climate there was very tense even while I was trying to speak. Right. So I It's very divisive. It is, it is severely divisive. However, the nonpartisan partisan thing, I don't think that's the big issue of the business. And I haven't seen that in the is the party thing. Okay. Right, no, no more questions from the audience. Uh, if you <laughs> okay. I did let that one be answered. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank Can you. Can I ask one question, Senator? Um, so, would you agree that you would find it fascinating that I know we've had two meetings, but we've not heard from either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party if, I mean, if we're going to have a partisan conversation? Mm -hmm. Maybe it may have actually been fun, like to actually have both party chairman persons here to have be involved in this discussion. And I, and I say that because I know you as an elected official, me as an elected official, the school board members, we all pay our qualifying fees, and where does that money go? It goes to each party. And so I, I think through this conversation at some point, I know I said this at the last meeting, I, I think myself, you, Senator Dixon, Mr. Le Senator Lester and Senator Payne would all agree. Like, I think at some point, we'd like to hear from the parties at some point as to, you know, what, what are their opinions, mm -hmm. um, I think, as we kind of go through this process at the same time. And to that point, just like that question was posed on a Republican primary ballot, I think we should pose it on a Democratic primary ballot, all the same. And I do know that the Democratic Party here... I'll let you all figure out your business. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but we have, they have addressed it when it came up during the session, when this issue, and I do believe our Gwinnett Democratic Party put out a statement. Uh, but I, too, would welcome an engagement by both chairs and, and, and let's see what they have to say. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Any further Thank questions? You. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, one comment I'll make before we go on uh, to the next speaker, uh, you know, I, this, I'm a freshman as Senator uh, Nikki Merritt is as well, first year in office, but th this school board issue in, in not just singling out uh, the nonpartisan issue, but it, it is what I hear from my constituents most. Just wanted to make that uh, apparent to folks. I mean, I've heard from, golly, 
hundreds or thousands of, of parents um, that are concerned in my district, uh, some outside of my district across Gwinnett County. So just want to make that, that statement as well. And we do have the chairman of the Gwinnett Republican Party uh, for Gwinnett County here, Sammy Baker. So he is, is in attendance. Uh, and also, uh, as far as the notice portion, uh, you know, this has been sent out through Senate Press. It's, it's gone to the AJC. Uh, so folks have been made aware of this. I just want to make that comment as well. Um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Tweedy. If you would come forward, please. I'll try to make this a little more brief because I'm going to crunch for time. Um, basically, the comment uh, was said that I'm not sure if the politics would necessarily come out. That might be true. But what has changed since that election was the fact that Holly actually had to stand out there with signs for a write-in candidate because he couldn't qualify to get onto a partisan ballot to run against an unopposed Democrat candidate. He had to be written in. He couldn't even be on the ballot. I think the big problem we have here is tons and tons of money is coming in to get seats. Uh, Chairman Blair, he had over $60,000 worth of donations to his campaign. That's almost as many votes as you got, Senator. That's a lot of money. Over 50,000 of that came from out of state. Not much of it came from this district. Not much of it came from that either. It's a problem of where does their allegiance lie at that point? You just got $2,000 from the Bloomberg family. Do you need to go push their agenda into our school? It's clearly partisan. And it doesn't need to be. If we have more, I like where the bill starts, but there needs to be more. We need more board members. Our voices aren't getting heard. We've got uh, what, 34, 40,000 parents per board member. How do people get heard? You got three board members that decide all the policy. The other two voices don't count. They override it. They fired a superintendent that made the school district great. I went through Gwinnett County School. I graduated from Collins Hill in 2003. Will Banks was a big part of the reason why my parents moved here, why I decided to move back. Every parent wants their kids to have a great education. The problem is not every parent is informed on who they're putting in charge. You make it nonpartisan, then go to vote. If you're not really sure about that candidate, chances are you're not going to vote on them. You're not going to vote at all in that line. You'll just vote down your party ticket, and you might skip that. And then that leaves the informed parents that go out and research and care to do something about it. You, you've got groups of people that don't even have kids in the system running for school board, putting their kids in private school, and making rules for kids they don't really care about. I'd rather see a bunch of parents become school board members than politicians using it as a step ahead. Chairman Blair's already decided he's not going to run again because he wants to go be state superintendent. This is stepping stone number one. Uh, Therese Johnson, she decided to run for the school board because she couldn't get state senate campaign funds. It, we don't need politicians in our school. I'd rather see teachers, I'd rather see administrators, and I'd rather see parents run. And they don't stand a chance if they have to join a party, fall in line to get on their ticket. I mean, like I said, we had to have a write-in. A write-in. What chance did that guy have? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Questions? Thank you for your comments. Any questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Would you be more comfortable if we had uh, a spot on the ballot for independence? I would be more comfortable if we didn't have any money coming from anywhere else except for inside the county. I know that's more of a campaign finance thing. And I'd be more comfortable if the people, like I said, were representative of people that are elected. I, I don't think there needs to be an independent. I think there needs to be a nothing. A simple, he can run, she can run, he can run. 
Don't have to qualify with any party. Don't have to qualify with anybody. Just sign up, get out, get the votes. So it's simple. Wouldn't you agree that it's, it's good uh, that our state ethics department identify where candidates get their money from? Um, yeah, they should still identify where the money comes from. That's always any kind of election. You should always know where the money comes from. I wish they'd go a little deeper into smaller donation amounts, but I guess they don't want to deal with the paperwork. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Lena. Hi, everyone. My name is Lana Goitia Boss, and I'm a political associate with the New Georgia Project and New Georgia Project Action Fund. We are a nonpartisan organization um, with efforts to register and civically engage, engage voters across Georgia. Um, there are four points that I want to address today. Community input, local control, fair elections, and public interest. First, since we're in Gwinnett County, let's talk about Gwinnett, which is home to the, my, the most diverse county population in the state. 70% of residents in Gwinnett are, are non-white, and over, and more important to this conversation today, over 80% of students are non-white. We want local diverse communities to have a say via public input and their own representation, rather than having politicians outside of their county make that decision for them. Scheduling a meeting that is supposedly to gain public input on a Thursday at 11 a.m. when students are taking finals, teachers are in classrooms, and parents are at work is a disservice to those impacted by this legislation. This is not how you gain public input. This is not how you ensure the voices of Gwinnett and Georgia citizens are taken into account and heard. If you're seeing that this is being done, um, done to help students and teachers and families, make this a fair and transparent process. Give people time to give more input and make input avenues more available. Second, let's speak more broadly about Georgia because I know this committee is not um, just about uh, the legislation that pertains to Gwinnett. Um, so Georgia voters deserve to have local control over their school board, not a partisan, state-driven process. Right now, the, the, the conversation is about hijacking local control and therefore removing power from families and communities. Not only does this change the election structure for the school board, but it would also redraw the district lines, and, it, and specifically in Gwinnett, would alter the makeup of that board. And um, third, Georgians deserve free and fair elections. One of the consequences of this movement right here is to move these elections from partisan, which would fall in the November election cycle, to nonpartisan elections, which are held in April and May of each election year. This would all but ensure that school board elections would have lower turnout and less minority turnout as well. So I want to urge this body not to rush this process, and I want to, and to ensure that the public have ample time and ample avenues to provide input, and to not use their local control and to advocate for the best interests of all Georgians. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any comments or questions from the board? See that our next speaker is uh, Teresa. She, she had to go. Oh, she did. Okay, thank you. Um, we're down to our last speaker, Steve Smith. Steve, so here is. I will try to keep this very brief because I know we're over time and we've had a lot of people go very, very long today. Um, Senator Jackson, at the last hearing, you asked a few different times, how would this affect the quality of education? How would it affect the teaching? I've had multiple teachers and administrators reach out to me and say that because of the current way the board is run, they feel they can't speak up about conditions in their job that they feel aren't in the best interest of the kids due to reprisal or possible discipline from the administration. When you have a highly partisan board that then installs a superintendent of their choice, as is their right, being elected at the time, but when you see the political side of a change, the minority party always feels abused. 
no different than the Democrats, for years in Gwinnett when it was majority Republicans saying they didn't feel represented. Whoever is not in power will always not feel represented. They will always feel their voice is not being heard. I have heard people in this room repeatedly infer that the entire reason this is being done is that the power seat is now with the majority black community. That's disgusting. That is disingenuous. If anything, you see the little chuckling chortle back there is from the NAACP president who can't ever shut up in a public hearing when other people are talking. Okay. This is what I'm talking about. He's okay. rude and you need Here to Here we go again. again. See, All right. All right, everybody comment. We're going to have a respectful meeting or I will end it. No, no comments from the audience. So Please that, direct again, your question towards us. What I was Mr. trying to say Thank you. before that happened. Everybody feels that they're not being heard. The thing that uh, the lady who just spoke talked about power being removed from the voters. We're not asking you to remove power from the voters. We're asking you to remove power from the parties. A May election is no less or no more unfair than a November one. And to say that minorities can't turn out for a May election, they have calendars. We put out the notices, they can show up. It doesn't remove anybody's ability to vote. It does not remove anybody's ability to make a choice for a candidate. Okay. Who is one of the Democratic heroes? The ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all. John F. Kennedy. You have voters on both sides of the aisle that are extremely ignorant to the actual candidates and the views due to the fact that if they see an R or a D, they know what they're supposed to do. That's not how you should elect anybody. And you asked somebody else that at the last hearing. Well, do you think statewide office should be nonpartisan? Absolutely. I don't need you getting a free ride because the Democratic Party put out marketing material for you and did this for you and did that for you. I want every candidate who is going to hold public office and be responsible for public funds and be responsible for public policy to actually have to earn the job. Not just go have dinner with Sammy Baker, who's the chairman of the Republican Party, get his endorsement, and then suddenly he's the guy. Why should our elected representatives happen that way? Now, when it comes to education, we all want what we think is best for our kids. This woman right here, and I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't get your name, but she is perfectly happy with the way the board is operating right now. And that's great for her. And if she likes the candidates that are there, she can vote for them again when there is no longer a D next to their name. Just like I can vote for the people I now vote for once the R comes off. And maybe there's a better candidate who has neither that's not there yet. Taking away the partisan elections would force voters to actually learn these issues. And everybody in this room, if they're being intellectually honest, will tell you that they're all ignorant voters in one way or another. Most people don't know who the hell's on the school board until it went the way they didn't want. And in the past, when people weren't happy with the other composition of five white folks, one of which was a Democrat, somebody said, y'all didn't have one, you did. When they didn't like those, they didn't know who they were either. They just knew they were Republicans, so they must be bad. What we're trying to get back to is true representation true voices who have to tell us up front ahead of an election exactly what they stand for because if i knew what they stood for i might not give them my vote anymore. that's all we're asking for here this has become a two-hour diatribe of people talking about white supremacy and supposed racism and all these other things we're just asking for free fair elections with candidates who don't have the backing of two giant political parties we want people who have to say, hi, my name is Steve Smith. I want to represent your district to help your children on the school board, and this is why. You also mentioned last time, let them do their jobs. And if they don't, vote them out. That's three years from now. My son's in third grade. He will be in sixth. Detrimental politics, I don't have three years to waste. If the pilot was drunk on my airplane, I'm not waiting for him to sober up to fix the plane crash. I want an immediate fix. And that's what we're asking for here. Chairman Blair talked about lame duck status. He's a lame duck. He's already mentioned he's not running for re-election. So he can sit there for a year and do whatever he wants. There will be no voters to hold him responsible in a year. We want people who are going to take care of our kids and take care of our system. That's all we're asking for. Thank you for your comments. Any comments or questions for the speaker? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, it appears that most of your questions have been addressed to me, so I uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to respond. Sure. Is it true, sir, that uh, about 25% of the voters in Georgia don't identify themselves as a Republican nor a Democrat, and they, true go, they truly go into a polling place to vote for a candidate they identify with? Well, according to polls, that's what they say. Technically, in Georgia, you don't register as a Democrat or Republican to vote. But according to whatever poll is taken, they say roughly 25% are independent or quote unquote moderate mm -hmm. voters. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, independent, uh, yeah, independent, moderate voters. Right. They don't identify with the candidate, whether they're a Republican or Democrat. Um, that seems to be the truth. Um, but uh, second question, sir, but what we're ultimately concerned with is the quality of education for our for our uh, children. And and I also believe it's to be true that the school board members don't have any direct uh, interaction with teachers. Well, that's, that's handed by the superintendent. That's how it's supposed to be done. We've had, a, a, somebody mentioned the COG interview, we've had board members that have usurped what their responsibility is and gone to teachers for things. There is a path for that, but our board is set up where they enact policy and procedure. And policy and procedure then falls under that that plan of education. If they put in new policies and procedures that change the way our kids are supposed to be educated by these teachers, it then most certainly affects their education. Yeah, I believe that, but is the truth, sir, that uh, teachers, that if they are threatened or ridiculed by a school board member, they can take legal action, and oh. most teachers feel comfortable working in a, in a system where the school board members don't have any direct control over their actions. I and feel 100% accurate with that, that's true. No. In most school systems. Thank you, sir. And I did want to make one other point. We brought up the fact there's 101 districts that are nonpartisan, and there's 71 or 109, whatever the numbers are. And I know some people have been asking, well, why do you have a problem with this? My question is, why do you not? You understand the politics and all these different things are divisive. Look at the room. So why, if we can go up a neutral system, why would you have a problem with that? That's all I want to know. Thank you for your comments. Can I speak? I was three sides. Yeah, if you can keep it to three minutes, we're running up on, uh, we're actually three minutes over. I'll have, this will be the last speaker today. Okay, I wasn't even prepared. We will not take comments from the audience. The board was not passed around, and I did not get the opportunity to sign. The board said, wait a minute, these people are... Ma'am, will you sit down? I'm about to end the meeting. We're actually over our time limit for tonight. All right, with that, I, with all due respect... I request, I request to have my voice heard in this room. If you had given proper notice, if you had an agenda, if you had let people know that they had to sign up, I would have done all those things. But because this meeting and this does not have an agenda, does not have what the policies are, I am requesting. You are not speaking. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. I am to speak. This meeting is adjourned. And that's it's been why, published for two weeks. And that's why. This is very difficult. The meeting's over. I'm sorry. The, for this, but. Everything.